So hi, uh, well, this is, I call this talk uh, Advanced Microservice Concerns. Um, my name is Steve, and I work at a company called Third Channel in Boston, Massachusetts, in the US. Um, let's talk about microservices. So before I begin, I should probably point out that there's uh, not much in this talk that exactly is Ruby related. Um, in fact, there's not really any code in this, it's mostly just theory. Um, but I believe this information is useful, and I think Yvonne inverted it too, which is why he asked me to speak about this stuff. Um, at Third Channel, we love microservices. Uh, Groovy is our most famous language in, 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 uh, in the services, and maybe there's some implementation there. I'm not sure. Anyway, the uh, agenda for this presentation uh, is to first briefly cover uh, the microservice architectural pattern and some of its advantages, um, and possibly the disadvantages, and then get into some of the advanced concerns, uh, where I group them by uh, their overall topic, uh, service design, organizational structure, and uh, DevOps. Um, first off, probably uh, begin with, has anyone, has everyone here heard of microservices? Is anyone here actually using them at, at work right now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, um, so, um, I sh I'll just go a quick overview of what I believe a uh, microservice pattern represents. Um, and I think it, they're, they're, they became, they're, their whole purpose is to fight against a distressing pattern uh, in software architecture called the monolith. So a monolith um, has become, I think, the natural response for many developers or companies when they first start out on a project. And when we say monolith, what we're talking about is a single, where your application is a single, logical, executable unit, often comprised of, at least in web applications, three components. Uh, your view layer, your CSS, and your JavaScript, and your HTML. Uh, the middle tier, where you contain most of your business logic, and then the data storage. Um, here's a quick representation of a, uh, an example e commerce apps for the middle tier. Um, the square box that represents that logical unit, whether that's a WAR file or a DAR value that you're deploying. Um, so we have, I've broken up into little components. So we have product catalog, uh, the general site administration, uh, the order history uh, service. Uh, or yeah, and uh, the, the, the billing component. Um, as I add features to my application, I simply tack them inside that on the alarm, and it keeps getting larger and larger every time I deploy it. And again, this, this the danger, I think, with the model of the pattern is that this feels like the right thing to do. Right? When, I'm, when I, I start a new project, I choose my framework, and I begin building it. Uh, you start out easy. Right? Your quick wins as I add new features. It's like, oh, now I need a shopping cart. Great. I'll add the shopping cart model and the controller, tack it in, deploy, and test. Um, in the long term, though, you'll, you will run into problems. Um, complexity grows quickly as you keep adding new features. Even if you're very, very careful, the, app, the application will inevitably become a mess. You might say, but I have distinct service layers in, in, my, in my application, keep things nice and separated. You know, I follow drive principles. You know, that's, I, I'll never have that problem, but you will. I mean, you'll throw in quick hacks here and there, you'll, you'll amass technical debt that you can never go back and fix, even though you swore to yourself that you would. Um, it, it gets to the point where if you open up your IDE and you just have a mess of controllers and models and all sorts of things, and no one in the company or anyone in your team really understands the whole thing. Um, and adding new features or, or, or bugs, I most Developers will spend huge amounts of time figuring out uh, how something works before they can even start. Right. So if I have, if there's a bug in the billing service, I have to look at the whole thing, see how it inter interconnects with everything else, try and figure out the exact spot where that bug might be occurring, make the change, and then hope I didn't break anything else. Uh, oftentimes, this might require dragging in other developers to help you figure out what's going on in the system. Uh, Twitter uh, has a blog post where, where they call this this, this uh, approach uh, an archaeological expedition, where they have to go through and sit through the entire history of the code, bring people along with them in order to figure out what to do next. So this frustration of working on large, monstrous applications, I think, uh, is why microservices have become so popular. Um, so when we use the term microservice, what exactly do we mean? Well, fundamentally, uh, what we're talking about is talking about building a distributed application. So instead of the monolith I showed you before, we said do this. We break up each of these components into their own um, into their own component, into their own separate executable units. Uh, 
might be saying, wait a minute, isn't this just service-oriented architecture? People have been doing this for a long time now. And in, in a way it is, but uh, uh, SOE has been around for years now, but microservices, though, are a much more focused and disciplined version of this. Uh, the reason being is that it involves technical and organiza organizational changes that are not defined within service-oriented architecture. Let's go over a few of them. First off, independence. In a microservice system, each service should be completely independent of each other. Now, this, this, this means that they're individually deployed, they have their own separate code repository, um, and they're independently developed. Um, this, uh, having them in their own code base, for example, allows you uh, to have independent history about how these, this particular feature evolved too, which is kind of a nice, nice thing. Um, this results in nice, isolated, separated code, which is great for adhering to design principles like separation of concerns, and you know, we all hear that term, we know it's a good thing. So this is taking it to an extreme level. Um, each service contains a single context, or rather each service is responsible for one thing. And this is what we say when we mean micro. So it's not so much that there's some arbitrary size that these things have to be, like 500 lines of code or something. The size of a microservice should be enough to fit, uh, where you, one developer can fit the entire thing in their head and understand everything that's going on uh, while maintaining the entire scope of the application uh, within the brain. Um, now this approach then leads to smaller, less complicated code bases. So again, let's say I was building an e-commerce application. I have my product catalog, I have my administrative service, I have my billing service, I have my order history service. Each one of them will, will be developed separately from each other and it will be far less complicated than if we try to jam the whole thing together. Now they do need to have um, a, a, a way to communicate with each other, and when you do so, it should involve simple, dumb communication technology. But they should be, each server should be very smart about how they do so. Which basically means no enterprise service buses. Has anyone heard, of, heard, of, heard about the enterprise service bus? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you would often find these in service-oriented architecture deployments. Um, and ge generally, they are very complicated pieces of code that involve uh, lots of logic uh, about how messages and communication should be routed. Um, now, in practice, uh, th these often become very complex and need to maintain a bunch of custom logic for manipulating <coughs> messages, and it just becomes another not massive thing that you have to maintain. So instead, microservices uh, uh, call for using, generally, either HTTP or uh, message queues. Uh, HTTP, because we're already building uh, a web application, why not use uh, uh, built-in native web technology? HTTP allows for direct communication between services, but it has the disadvantage of being synchronous. So while the request is active, both services that you're communicating with have their resources locked during the, during the course of that communication. Um, message queues, on the other hand, uh, are asynchronous, generally, but require some additional code or, uh, or another library for, for message formats. So you, you have to spend time developing uh, sort of the library that each of your services will use to facilitate communication, whereas with HTTP, you get communication out of the box. Um, so if you're using HTTP, basically, you, you, uh, you have a handful of services, you may end up with something like this, where I might have multiple product catalog services that know how to communicate with the administration service, which know how to communicate with my order history services, which know how to communicate with my billing service. Um, and it, it could quickly become a mess of interconnected, um, interconnected uh, services. And each service needs to know the address of the other services and how, how to reach them. Um, so if, if the user places an order, that code needs to know how to talk to the order history service and the billing service in, in a particular order. Uh, and then has to talk to the inventory service to make sure that I have proper inventory and things like that. Um, to help manage this, though, you end up having to use another service to help you uh, uh, identify the, the locations of these other services, a service discovery service. Um, Net uh, Netflix, for example, has uh, uh, released their internally developed uh, version of this called Eureka, which is on their, uh, their open source library, which is, which is uh, very useful and people seem to love it. And basically what happens is when a service comes up, it registers itself on the Eureka service. So when you say, when one of your other services says, okay, I need, uh, I need a location of a billing service. You don't. You don't. It doesn't. You don't maintain the, the address of the billing service in your particular location. It asks Eureka for the first available. Um, we 
the message-oriented approach on the other hand. Services don't know where each other are. They don't need to know about the address. They don't need to worry about. Don't even need to worry about who they're talking to. And not necessarily. They just need to know that if they send data or ask for data, <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> that, that, that they're going to get a response by broadcasting it right to the other event. Um, when an event needs to go out, it is simply generated. I don't need to post it in, in, in any direct uh, service. I don't need to. If I, if a user changes their address, I don't need to inform other services that a user, that user did that. I just broadcast user address change. And anything they have to listen to, to it can. Um, I prefer this approach for, for a variety of reasons you can already tell, which I'd be, I'd be happy to talk to anyone about this later. Um, the interesting thing about this, though, is that you, need, you do need to introduce uh, a new service um, that, that there are some messages, a, uh, a message broker or a message queue. Um, and the services do need to know the location of that particular broker. And this broker can be a cluster, for example, doesn't necessarily be a single service. Um, regardless, uh, uh, there's two options I think that are very useful for this approach. Uh, RabbitMQ is sort of the, the classic, I think. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's another great example of uh, Kafka, which is, a, uh, which is a, a, an Apache project. I'm thinking of switching to. I mean, we use Rabbit right now locally, but I hear really good things about, uh, about Kafka. But they're, they're, they're a little bit uh, different in how they operate. Uh, Kafka is more uh, native. They use a bunch of uh, little, little Linux, I think this is correct, it's a bunch of little, little Linux uh, operations. Uh, Rabbit MQ is built on Erlang, it's a little bit higher service. Uh, but it was developed for trading software, so you know what that's. So, uh, people that work with money need stuff done. <laughs> yeah. um, Lastly, so microservices also should concentrate, um, while they should concentrate using very simplistic channels, they should also be very smart about that. And if that's how they do it, they should also maintain restful communications. Um, I feel that when many people think of REST, um, or say that they have a RESTful API, uh, they're, they're, what, they're, what they're really thinking of is they, they perform CRUD operations, pretty free, but they believe over HTTP using the HTTP verbs. And that's not really what REST is. Um, there are many more aspects to it beyond that. Uh, for example, no state should be shared. When these services are talking to each other, they, 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 need, they need to be as stateless as possible. For one, trying to maintain shared state across a dis distributed application is madness. The REST, the REST specification also calls for caching your data, which is great, of course, from no caching data, um, layering your services, and ensuring that they have a uniform interface. Um, when, we, when we talk about layering, um, what that means is that if I'm sending data, um, as long as the data is handled, the service shouldn't uh, tr uh, should, should trust that the handlers know what to do. They should, if that data needs to be passed on to another service, they don't need to worry about that. Uh, a uniform interface implies many things, but I'm uh, going to take a shortcut and just say that each of your services should communicate with each other via the same standard technique. Um, if anyone wants to argue about ABOS, Hypermedia is the engine of application state, and they're going to have to do that. Um, lastly, from an organizational standpoint, uh, the teams building the service should be cross purpose and dedicated to that particular service. Teams in charge of the service should come from a variety of disciplines engineering, QA, art and design, product management, uh, perhaps the deployment engineer, etc. Um, I'll get into more of this later. It's very important to know that subject. Um, Microservice architectures have been gaining huge followings in the past couple years due to some of the benefits they bring. Um, because our systems are independent of each other, like I mentioned earlier, this promotes natural loose coupling. Uh, individual teams can develop their services independently, which helps to complexity. Um, <coughs> each service can be built according to the, te to the technology that best suits it. You're not locked into one language or one framework. So if uh, Node.js is better for one particular service, build in Node. If, uh, you know, Grails is, or Spring Boot is better from another application built in that. If Postgres is the ideal database for this particular service, awesome. If Redis is best for this other service, <laughs> then that's, we're not locked into any one thing. But of course, we're always going to use Groovy, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's easy to scale microservice applications uh, to meet particular use demand. And this, is, I think, is a very, very important topic. Because what, by, by making these smaller services, which, what you end up doing is being very, very efficient about how you scale. So as demand for the application grows, I can scale just the components or services that I need, rather than needing to, in a, in a monolith application, redeploy the whole thing behind some sort of load balancer or something like that. If I'm 
if I'm if I have my, if my application is in one WAR file and I need to, to scale it, what I end up doing is making a whole new instance of this masterpiece. And if I'm just if I just have a lot of traffic on my order history service, I can scale this out a little bit. Um, I borrowed this slide from uh, Martin Feller's website. He has a very good discussion about this, this topic. Um, so what this does is it allows for targeted growth. So you know that if a particular service is getting a lot of attention, you should focus more of your internal development resources on it. Um, and from a computational standpoint, it also, it also makes you more efficient in um, how you're spending your money on, in terms of your computational resources. So if you're on AWS, being able to target exactly how you grow and where you grow, it will lead to it, it keeps your build time. Um, and speaking of scaling, I think this is probably uh, my favorite aspect about this. It's, it's using microservices, it's easy to scale development. So um, scaling development is generally very difficult. Um, with a microservices architecture, you have an advantage where it's relatively easy for developers to work with this, uh, with this approach. Because the complexity for a given service is smaller, it's easier to reason about, it's easier to find bugs, it's easier to know that um, if I need to build a new feature, I, need, I, I know exactly where it needs to go because the service is relatively small. I can fit the entire thing within my brain, know exactly where I, where I need to be, uh, and fix the issue before I add the feature. Um, Microservices, microservices also allow us to fail fast and to start over. Um, if we find that a particular, particular technology or a particular approach that we're working on isn't working, it's easy to refactor or replace the service. Um, has anyone here ever worked on a team you know, with them on the collective level? It's, it's not so easy. Um, it's sort of, it's difficult. It can be difficult to wrap your mind around a distributed system and how things are all interconnected. Um, Splitting your code into services can add additional operational complexity um, as you might have some more moving parts. And it can add some communication uh, lag. So if a service has to talk to three other services and it's doing it over HTTP, that, that can add some additional time to that request. Um, I, I, I disagree with this one a little bit because it, um, by, by splitting things up, it, you, you do re inherently reduce the complexity of the individual service. Um, you may hear someone in your organization say, well, what if service X goes down? It's central to our business. Um, that person is not ready for microservices. <laughs> That's the wrong thing to say. Um, uh, microservices uh, also require some additional focus on DevOps for the work, like streamlining deployments and you know, getting these things up on wherever you're, where, where you're handling them, and stuff like that, and like that. These can all, all these problems, while valid, can be addressed, reduced, or handled. These next sections cover some of these advanced concerns when working with microservices. Um, they are things that everyone should be aware of. So first, service design. Uh, as we're building our individual services, what should we be aware of? Um, I'll, I'll reiterate here that each service needs to be a single bounded context. Um, it's a bit tricky, but this point basically states how large a service should be. Again, it's not any particular line size or anything like that, but it's Service should be small enough that it fits within the entire functionality, fits within a single developer's mind. Um, your services should be resilient, which means that they should embrace and welcome that errors will occur. The service may go, to, or will probably go down at some point, um, and they should know how to handle any potential error. So, if our order billing system goes down, the site shouldn't shut down. We shouldn't, we shouldn't break. But the web, the, the product browsing system should say, "Oh, I'm sorry, your orders are temporarily down, but." Hey, keep adding things to your shopping cart. Or better yet, take the order, put it on the queue, and then process the order once the service comes back. If, uh, if yeah, I should still be able to, to administer the site, I should still be able to get users. Um, the overall rule, I think, is that your services should maintain their independence, just like we talked about earlier, and fail independently as well. Not bring each other down if something, if something uh, crashes. Because we have that additional communication of, uh, uh, lag between each service, we have to make sure that each of our services are as fast and efficient as they possibly can be. Um, you should strive to return a result as a service, as a, when you maintain a service, you should strive to return a result as fast as you can. Um, in the US, we have an idiom called hot potato, uh, which means to get rid of something as fast as you can. Um, speed is king. Uh, several years ago, uh, an engineer with Amazon named Greg Linden uh, revealed that the company ran an experiment where they intentionally slowed down their site performance um, and they were, they were able to demonstrate that a 100 millisecond delay, so a tenth of a second, uh, resulted in a 1% drop in sales. Now for Amazon, that's millions of dollars. 
right? So just that, that surge <coughs> in speed means that they were they were able to take less money from people, which you know is interesting. Um, I used to work as a consultant, and uh, I would go uh, and I you know worked for with e-commerce companies before, and I would go in and I'd say you know oh you're doing X Y and Z wrong, you know, you're not, you're not handling orders in the queue, your your site's performance is really slow. Like there, there's a physical limit to how much money you can take per day. You know if you would just implement these features, you would make more money. And they didn't, they didn't listen. <laughs> and they were just completely ignoring everything. Um, each service should be responsible for one particular thing within your application. Uh, this relates to the single bounded context, but it, it, it's, it sort of spells it out. Um, each service should be an authority on some data, or an authority on a particular process. Um, for example, I may have a user service uh, that is the source of truth. For, for users within my, my system. Or I can have an email service that's responsible for um, broadcasting and emails, managing templates, and things like that. Um, next, uh, embrace eventual consistency. Um, is there, has everyone heard of eventual consistency before or where the concept? And so um, basically what it means is that I couldn't really find it, think of a good diagram for this, but um, in a distributed system, you must accept that an individual client or service may not have the most recent view of the data. Um, eventually, every service will have uh, their, their view of the world consistent with every other service, um, which, is, which is an interesting concept. And sometimes people who come from an acid environment that, that want high consistent, I'll get, actually, I'll get into more of this later too, but want highly consistent data, are generally scared of this sort of thing. Um, you, know, you know, all my data is not up to date all the time. And then you know, the, the, the question that you should ask these people if they ever bring that up to say, okay, well, if someone if see, if someone accesses your data, do you lock the row in the database to prevent anyone from adding more data? Right. So if I bring up a user on my web page, is that row locked from being updated? No, generally not. Right. So somebody could come in and update that user. So the second you bring it up on the screen, it may not be consistent with the data that's in the database. So, uh, yeah, it's, an, it's an interesting sort of. So these next <coughs> two topics are perhaps, I think, the most difficult in this talk. Um, it's, it's hard to understand, and it's going to be hard to explain to so I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, first up, something called the CAP theorem. Anyone heard of the CAP theorem before? Yes, very good. So basically, the CAP theorem states that there are three attributes or three guarantees that we can make within, within a, a, a distributed system, or three things that a distributed <coughs> system can, uh, can offer us. Um, one, consistency. Uh, when an update occurs within the system, all services uh, know about that, uh, that update when it happens. And so like I just said, it's probably not uh, a good idea. Um, availability. Uh, when information is, is asked for a particular service, it responds as quickly as it can. Um, and partition tolerance. A service is able to handle or deal with failures occurring in other services. Um, and for a distributed system, um, you're only allowed to have two of these attributes at any given point in time. And I think, uh, excuse me, based on what I talked before, you probably see where I'm going with this. Um, this was originally called, uh, a little bit of history, this was originally called Brewer's Conjecture. And it was, uh, it was actually proved in 2012, uh, and it so became a hero. Uh, incidentally, this paper is also where the term eventual consistency comes from. Uh, eventual consistency comes from. Um, which is interesting because I thought it's been around for a long time. It's only three years old. Um, cap decisions can be service specific as well, too. This is one of the key takeaways from the paper: is that it's not it's not all or nothing. Two points out of two, two points out of three. Each service can be can have a varying degree uh, of, uh, of of these things. So I could have a system that's highly consistent. Um, and it's a little bit available and a little bit partition um, In general, though, especially with working with web apps, it's very important to have highly available data and, uh, and, and high partition tolerance. Like, the user will forgive you if the email maybe doesn't go out, or if uh, you know they may, they may maybe they have to make an update twice or something like that. But if uh, yeah. uh, but banks for money, though, when you think about money, you want to be highly consistent. People get really upset if uh, you know their balance is not they balance me in the bank. Um, last, um, let's talk about data locality. You should be very, very concerned about data locality, which is a weird term, and I'm not actually sure what it means in English either. Um, there, there, 
there are two aspects to, to this concept. Um, uh, one, spatial. So uh, how, how far away is my data when it's stored? So in a single database, data can be considered highly spatial if it's in the same table. Um, data which is reachable by joins is less spatial because it's a join away. Um, in a distributed environment, it's a service call away. Um, so, so data which uh, data which is, which has these steps to reach is less efficient to access. Um, temporal uh, being being highly temporal means that the data is read frequently. So highly temporal data is an excellent ca uh, can be an excellent candidate for caching, for example, especially if it's not updated very often. Um, Again, these terms take on a, a very different meaning in a, in a distributed system. So in an ideal distributed environment, uh, each system would be completely separate. Each system is an authority um, uh, on a particular uh, set of data. Um, there will, however, there will always be some conceptual overlap between our, our data or our objects. So for example, let's say we have, again, the e-commerce system. Uh, where we have our web front end, and then we have our user service, and then we have an order history service, uh, and both communicating over uh, Rabbit and Human Mill there. Uh, the order history service maintains order information about the users, uh, about users. So anytime a user makes an order on our site, we keep their history so they can look at it later. Um, the order history service needs to have some understanding of what the user is. It doesn't necessarily need to know their their name or their email address. But it needs some sort of, it, its concept of what the user is, is really just the user's identifier. Um, which is, which is you know, generally fine in this case, um, because there's no, that, that data will not really have to be updated, the user's ID is probably not ever going to change. Um, but to the same chart from before, but let's add another table. Um, communication, so let's, so let's add the, the email communication service down there. Um, this service also conceptualizes the user but with a different subset of information. So I still have the identifier, but I may also have the user's email address on there. So uh, if I store the email address on the user service, um, which, which should be the authority about the user's email address? So my, my email server uses it more often. Every year email goes out, I might be using that email address. But that email address is key information about the user. So who's the right, who's, which service is the right authority on the particular email address? Um, it's, it's a tough choice, I think. You don't, but you, but you don't want the data to become too, um, too to, to spread out too far. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem, I think. Um, so one compromise is to, unfortunately, synchronize the data, uh, to synchronize the email address across both services. So if a user updates their email address, I could broadcast a message that says, you know, hey, email service, the user updated their email. Here's their email address. Save it in your system. Um, uh, or we could remove the email address entirely from the, from the communication service, uh, so the user has no concept, or the email, so the email address has no concept of the user's email address. Um, but simply blindly sends emails out. So if the email service gets a notification, instead of saying, "Hey, send the email to this user," it says, "Hey, send out this email. Here's the email address you want to send to." That way, there's no data synchronization. The user service maintains the authority. Um, or third option, uh, we can cache the email address on the communication service. So then, if if the email service gets a request to send out an email and it says, "Hey, send it to this user," the email service could say, "Well, oh, I don't know this user. What's their, e what's their email address?" and then ask for it from the user service. Those are all. Those are all some different strategies. I don't know if either one's actually the best one. Very much dislike, over. I very much dislike syncing data. Um, so my recommendation uh, is, is to not use the data synchronization option. Uh, and emphasize that again, do not sync data as much as you can. But there will inevitably, inevitably be some points uh, where you will have to synchronize uh, some data. But try to keep down that as much. Keep try to keep that down as much as possible. Um, because inevitably, what's going to happen is the data will become out of sync. So even if I do, even if my best intentions keep that user email address in line with what's in the user service, eventually some users' email addresses will drift, and they may not get updated. You know, network problems, or maybe they get the message, or there's an error. You might think you you might think you've unit tested these services, so you're sure that it'll never get out of sync. It will. Um, 
And then you'll have to go and create some jobs or processes to go in and resync data between systems. Like a, every now and then I'd run a job that says, okay, update, you know, make sure the email service will have to go and update every user's email address and make sure that it's, that it's up to date. Um, so we've tried synchronizing some data at the channel in the past, and uh, these data discrepancies were the primary cause of bug reports. It's, it's terrible. Um, if you, so basically, if you overhear anyone on your team say, well, we could just synchronize the email address, immediately roll up a newspaper and then whack them on the nose like a dog. <laughs> <laughs> Horrible. <laughs> so the goal with microservices is to have highly spatial data and efficiently handle temporal um, it's, it's a very tricky concept, but it, uh, it's, it's basically the primary thing I think you should be concerned about if you're trying to work with microservices at this point. Next, uh, organizational structure. So, like I said earlier, you're going to want cross-discipline teams. So each service should have a team assigned to it. It's made, it's, it's made from a variety of disciplines. So some, some companies will, will tend to break down their, their, uh, their tech workers into different uh, groups. So you might have the QA department, you might have the user experience department, you have all the engineers sitting together in a cube farm somewhere, and you might have the, the DBAs tucked back in the corner. Um, but microservices say, don't do that. Instead, break them up and, and make teams of, um, of various disciplines suitable for that particular purpose. Um, you know, put a US person along with a QA person along with an engineer, have them sit together, have them work together, um, and don't, don't have these labels as the US team. Or that kind. Um, one of the best experiences I ever had working uh, with, with a given team something like this. It wasn't a microservice, but it was, we'd have these small little um, teams focused together working on a particular feature within the site. And uh, I had a, I literally had a QA person sitting right next to me. So anytime I would commit uh, code, she would, she would see that it happened, pull it down, run her test that she wrote, and immediately say, you broke it, fixed it, uh, uh, fix it now, and I would fix it before she could even complete the Jira ticket. And it was this great little uh, uh, iterative um, uh, iteration that I think could only happen by having us so close together and, and, and working together. <coughs> um, with that, uh, each team is ultimately responsible for the individual services. Um, and when I say responsible, I mean it. So if the service malfunctions over the weekend, guess who's fixing it? That particular team. Um, you know, this is, this is uh, if you commit code, you're responsible for fixing it. And what this tends to do is to make sure that Members, your team members will naturally start writing a lot more unit tests and, <laughs> and make things as solid as possible before it goes out. Because they do not want to get uh, uh, you know, texted at 3 in the morning and have to wake up and go fix them. Um, with that, your team should also be highly autonomous. Um, what that means uh, is, uh, or sorry, but they also need to be highly aligned with the business. So essentially what this means is provide your team with, with, or, or there were teams, such as they should be provided with an end goal, but given the freedom to choose the right technology and the right strategy to get there. Because if, uh, you, you shouldn't necessarily care what's going on in the service so long as it responds to the, um, to the, to, to the particular uh, API calls as, <coughs> as fast and quickly as it can. Um, so I can borrow this drawing from a, from a Spotify blog post on their engineering culture. And they're they're uh, we'll getting a little bit more later, but they're, they're, they're a great example for, for how to structure teams. Um, so basically what this is saying is that, you know, the boss is, uh, you know, saying, we need to try and cross the river, and they get a bunch of happy developers, and he's letting them choose the best way to do it. You will need some architects or some team leads to champion this microservice vision. Uh, these people will need to have, uh, again, the vision or the direction uh, to, to guide and lead people. Uh, this leadership team may not necessarily have to be one person, but it could be, it could be a small group. Um, they'll need to maintain the shared vision um, from which they can guide the rest of the company down this microservices path. Because uh, if you try this right now, you're going to work and you have the, the, the power to, to make this change, let's say, uh, you were going to find people in your company that disagree with it. They'll complain for all the various reasons I mentioned earlier. You know, building a distributed system is hard. I got to build, a, I gotta build a, whole new a whole new service for each new feature. Um, but what they're really saying is that this new approach is too hard, and they're afraid. Uh, the leadership team must be there to guide <coughs> people and, and to educate them, and to make sure, to reassure them that you know things will be okay. 
and to encourage communication, which leads to the next point, Conway's Law. Um, who here has heard of Conway's Law? No, I have to come back then. All right. So um, I talked a little bit about this when I was at Greece last year. Um, and uh, I was actually at another conference a, a, a month ago, and it was, all, it was all about microservices, and every other talk was about Conway's Law. Um, it's, it's interesting. Basically, I'm just saying that I spoke about it last year, so I'm going to put trends in there. <laughs> Basically, what Conway's Law says is it's somewhat tongue in cheek, but it was, uh, it was written in 1968 by this guy named Melvin Conway. And uh, basically what he's saying is that the structure of any given computer system will begin to reflect the social structure of the people who built it. Um, so you know, what, what that means is if you have someone who doesn't, who doesn't talk to somebody else, their particular bits of code aren't going to work together either. So um, while teams should be organized around services, these services still need to communicate with one another. Um, if Conway's law is not observed, you ignore this, uh, some interesting things can happen. Um, you may start ending up with situations where your interest service APIs are not matching up, or you may make a call and the field can be completely gone. Um, teams expecting data to be in services may not actually be there. Um, a misunderstanding of what a service provides team A, um, you know, a, a misunderstanding of what service provides, um, you may enter situations where one team might be waiting for another team to finish their service, and instead of trying to help them, they'll just sit there and say, team B's not team can't do anything until they're finished. Um, and eventually, you may get to a point where teams start blaming or attacking each other for problems within, within the system. So, you know, you might, there, there can be arguments and attacks where, you know, you might say, man, the team working on the shopping cart service is terrible. The code is always broken. Instead of trying to help them, you just sit there and, you know, shut down. It's, it, it's... Avoiding Conway's Law uh, is not easy. And there's, I don't think there's really a clear way to do it. Um, but. It's, you, know, you have to try your best to encourage communication between, and, and collaboration, importantly, uh, between teams. Um, some suggestions I've seen have been to rotate people periodically throughout teams so they can see what it's like working in, in all these other services. Um, get everyone on a shared uh, communication channel. Slack is a very popular choice. So I hear you Slack. Yeah, yeah. Um, do, you know, do you know it's valued at $2.8 billion right now? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, uh, but one, one important thing to do, especially with the microservice part, uh, approach, is to ensure that each service's API is published and highly visible to other teams. Uh, Jeff Bezos at Amazon uh, famously a number of years ago released a memo that basically said all teams must now communicate via the API. So they had to have a published, documented um, contract that they had to adhere to. Uh, and, and they were one of the first. Uh, uh, what came out of that was essentially AWS now because they start building those little services, they realize that they could sell this approach to other people. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, Spotify is, uh, is also a, a very good at this. They, they have what they call tribes and guilds, which are, which are strange terms for to describe developers. Um, <laughs> but they have small teams of people focused on a service, um, which can be, which can be um, grouped into sort of the operational area of that particular, of that, those group of services. that come out of a set of services that are related to um, Say the users in my particular e-commerce app. You know, maybe, maybe it's something involving user, maybe there's something involving order history, maybe there's something involving sharing or notifications. So I might have, uh, I have a section of my tribe is sort of based around the user area of the services. And then they have guilds, which are sort of the, the UX and the, and the BBA team. So they can talk about what's going on in their individual uh, services. So they can share information about what's going on. Uh, no. Next, uh, DevOps. Uh, I'll go quickly through this one because I only have a few minutes left. Um, but because each team is responsible for their deployments, like I mentioned earlier, nearly everyone in your team is going to get some DevOps experience. Because you're involved with maintaining and also involved with deploying it, everyone's going to have to, um, to, to, get, to get used to this, whether they like it or not. Um, first up, uh, it's very, very important to have centralized service monitoring and logging. It's absolutely vital, um, an absolute requirement. Uh, this monitoring, and, and generally this, this is generally done by having a, a, another service in your platform that's responsible for performing heartbeat checks on your services and gathering metrics about them. Um, it should be responsible um, for also acting as a centralized logging platform for each of these services. Right? If you have a bunch of services, you don't want to have to go in, SSH in, look at the logs for every single one. 
it's good. It's really good to aggregate them all in one location that you can go back uh, and look at it later. If you may be thinking, well, that's going to be a ton of data if I have if a bunch of services. You're right. Um, there's many applications or paid services out there that store and store and visualize this data. Um, many people I spoke to recommend uh, the, this open source Elk Stack, where you basically just log stash to process your logs, put in Elasticsearch for easy querying, and then you use, use a visualization, visualization tool called Kibana for nice metrics and graphs. If you can get data from uh, services and be aware of their, what, what, uh, be aware of what they're doing without having to SSH in, um, and you, uh, if you never have to SSH in, then you're doing it right. Uh, I read some I read somewhere that some companies will actually block the SSH the SSH port um, on their instances of their Amazon BBC just to prove the point. Um, even if your services use different languages or frameworks, do your best to make sure that everyone is using the same general approach. To them. Um, the, the <coughs> containerization is the new hotness, and things like Docker or Rocket um, can make a very standard way to, to deploy Go. Um, it's also very important to have small, fast deployments. So an approach where, like a, let's say, let's say a no-button approach, if I push to GitHub, uh, it, it's built with something like CodeShip, uh, because the, an image is created in Docker Hub, and then it automatically goes out. That can be, uh, can be very uh, efficient. A little bit scary. <laughs> um, <laughs> lastly, uh, continuous deployment. Uh, your engineers should be releasing things as soon as they are ready. So push a feature when it's complete, get it out the door. Um, now, you may, I wasn't trying to diagram this either, but um, one thing that should concern your team are the moments where a release does have dependencies on other. So I have to deploy service C before I deploy service A, or else B will break. However, these cases should be rare. Um, and in general, this will not happen, but someone will bring this up, guaranteed. Um, the day-to-day -day deployments, though, will be amazing. Push code, uh, push code is done, it's out in the wild. I may not have tested it, so I may run into a bug, fix the bug, goes back out, uh, fixed again. Um, once you get there, you're able to do that, uh, it feels great. So, um, that's really all I have, I think. Uh, but in summary, uh, let me give a quick laws of the microservice. Um, be independent. But at the same time, communicate with coworkers. A well-designed system requires constant communication between your team members. Um, keep your data close and cache it well. Do not sync anything. Um, and get some excellent monitoring in place. And always move towards continuous uh, deployment. With that, I thank you. I have eight seconds left. Oh. Is, there, is there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Are there some criteria uh, how we should like uh, divide our application in microservices? Great, that is that is a great point. Um, so the question was, uh, is there any criteria around how I divide? Uh, so, um, so if you if you've, been, if you've been building your application already with nice service layers and nice individual services, then it, then, then you have a good place to start from there. You may already you may look at your code and realize you already have a file called user service, mm -hmm. um, and it's a little bit tricky because. A code level service and a microservice application, separate application deployable thing is also called a service. So it can get a little confusing when you start thinking that. But um, in general, I think it's I think it's good to, to break to, to, to take a component of your code and mentally break it down to the point where um, you can again you can reason about it all at once, and it's as simple as it can be. Um, and and start, start extracting bits like that. Uh, and if you're moving to a microservice approach from the monolith, um, a good way to start, that's actually what, what we're doing in third channels, we started out with the monolith, and now we're breaking it up. Um, uh, <coughs> find new features that can be reasonably thought of as a service, start there, set up the communication channel, and then slowly ex extract bits and components from the original monolith and make new services out of them um, as we have time, and, 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 if, and if you need to, if someone says, we'll go add this feature, uh, or go update this particular bit of the code, go refactor it. That's a good point to extract. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, if you use a message broker yes. to communicate with your services, uh, there's a, well, two things I kind of figure out how do you, how do you do, uh, how do you implement circuit breakers <laughs> and uh, and uh, also RPC style communication. Right. So that's um, so the question was, if I'm using a message broker, how do I do things like um, circuit breaking or RPC calls? And so I'm not 100% sure what circuit breaking is. As far as I understand it from uh, at least what I've seen on uh, presentations from Netflix is if 
I start seeing a bunch of errors prop up in my service. Correct me if I'm wrong. If I start seeing a bunch of errors prop up, and I see a, 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 if I'm monitoring it, and I see a high rate of failure, I shut off the service, so it will, so it will um, stop breaking until I can get to the point where um, I can start it, and then I start letting traffic back in until I, until I, I can, I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied that it's up and working again. Is that, is that right? Yeah, it's also related to responsibility. It's not that uh, the wrong engineers get woken up at 4 o'clock uh, in the morning. It's just that the guys who actually broke the, the service get woken up. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, I haven't run, I haven't had to deal with that yet. Good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right, which is great. Um, but, 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 um, and then, sorry, what's your second question? Um, RPC. Good, good okay. Because um, there's somewhat, I think, uh, so, so RPC is relatively easy with the message queue because um, a, a lot of times, at least with Reddit, you can programmatically generate temporary queues. So one strategy, um, when I'm, oh, this would be better with, I have a chalkboard. <laughs> this would be, this would be, <laughs> with, with that? yeah. All right. I have horrible board handwriting, so nobody judge <laughs> me. <laughs> so I have service A, and he's and needs to ask service B for information. They have the message, have the message broker, and then B, have B, B and A have their regular, let's say, queues. And these queues are monitorable, so I can see, for, to go back to your circuit breaker question, I can see how, how large a particular queue is if it's filling up. And if I have multiple instances of A, that are all listening on this queue. For one, that gives me neat scaling because I can find if I see this queue getting extra large, I just add more uh, day instances, and if it's completely drained, I can shrink the number of days I have. Um, so for a circuit breaker problem, I'm sort of jumping around here. I apologize. If this thing gets filled up and my intentional and, and my internal service is detecting a whole bunch of errors coming from A, I could probably wire up something to sort of shut this down for a while and sort of and, and then programmatically revive it. Um, that, that's an interesting subject. I'd have to explore it. I think it's fascinating. And I'll have to worry about that at some point, I'm sure. Um, but for the RPC style, if A needs to ask a question of B, um, B receives a, B, uh, A basically sends a message out to Q, goes up in B's box, or B's Q. A, uh, A secretly hands that off. Or, uh, hold on, sorry, hold on. It could, it could, there's two ways. One, it could asynchronously hand it off and then have some sort of command object that's sort of waiting for the response to be regenerated. Um, these response will need to have um, a unique identifier of which A service it was. And then, and then it can resume operations once it sees the message come back in. Um, that's nice because it's asynchronous, but it's additional, it can get complex because you have to worry about which service it's going back to and um, what's happening over what A was doing. Um, when it asks for the RPC call, it may not be able to asynchronously um, to wait for a response. So what we do um, is if A needs to ask for data from B, it, it sends B a message saying, hey, I need, uh, or it basically emits a message saying, hey, somebody sent me this user information. It doesn't necessarily know it's directly talking to B. It's knowing, it knows it's talking to a service that responds to give me user information. Um, but, it, but it also generates a temporary queue that's unique to A. And this is a randomly generated UUID. And it, it passes along in the message saying, hey, when you have this answer, send it back to this queue. And so then uh, A gets the message and deletes the queue. That's great. Yeah. Does that make sense? It's a little wild when you first hear it, and it can, it can be a little scary, but it seems to work really well in practice. Any other questions? How about duplication, data duplication? Ah, so how about code duplication? So you're saying, if, you know, if I have a nice utility class in A, do uh, I use it in B? For the, uh, I'm thinking about validation of the data, you know? Yeah. Uh, the purchasing service and the mm -hmm. customer service, so you have to enter an order, so you have to validate the, the user. Great. Um, yeah, that's, that's a really good question. So uh, the question is, how do I deal with uh, data validation? Um, yeah, that's, that's interesting. So I mean, it's... I think it's, it's dependent on the on the particular service. Um, one, uh, the, the the main the, the authority of the user service, um, you know, it, it it has to maintain essentially a contract. Basically says, this is the information I have about the user. If you need user information, you ask me for it. Um, each service is responsible for validating the data, the, the requests that come in, so they can you know throw 400. Um, 
sorry, I lost my train of thought. Was, is there a good so you can you ask the question again? Where's that right? Customer uh, and order. Mm -hmm. um, do you, you, so, so if I if I if if so if I if I have an incoming order object, how, yeah. do I how do I validate it? Yeah. Um, so yeah, so each each service, so the 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 order service um, that's receiving the order data, it needs to maintain as part of that API saying, hey, this is the data I will accept, I will validate this message as as, as valid. Anything else, I will reject. Um, and it's up to the people that want to talk to that to maintain that, that, that they're sending proper data. Um, if, if, if an error occurs, I can emit an event in my centralized, uh, centralized service and maintain a log of all these exceptions and things like that. But yeah, it's up to the individual services to, 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 to validate the data, to maintain a, a specification that here's what, I, here's what I send out, here's what I accept. Um, this goes back to the, the whole Conway's law thing to make sure that, these people, that everybody's talking and that they understand what each service does and the data it's inside the seat. Does that make sense? Okay, hey Jeff, do you have a question? The last one. Last one, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, they talk about this afterwards. Yeah, we'll talk afterwards. It's probably easier. Okay. okay. <laughs> I think that means I still have time for more questions. But all right, no. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.